Welcome to the fifth session of the online colloquium Pluralizing the Anthropocene, re-envisioning the future of the planet in the 21st century. My name is Gonzalo Santos. I'm a social cultural anthropologist based at the Research Center for Anthropology and Health and the Department of Life Sciences at the University of Coimbra. I am also the director of the international research network SciTech Asia. I will be the moderator of today's session. Today's session will take us to the Anthropocene in China, and I have the pleasure to host distinguished China scholars, Yi Fei Li and Judith Shapiro. Hi, Judith. Hi, Yi Fei. Welcome to the Pluralizing the Anthropocene. Many Hi, thanks Gonzalo. for joining us. Yeah. Hi, thank, thank you, Gonzalo. You so We're so happy to be here. Before moving on to a proper introduction of our distinguished speakers, I would like to say a few words about the background of this colloquium, especially for those of you who are joining us for the first time. Pluralizing the Anthropocene is a project curated by myself and my colleague Ana Luisa Santos, an anthropologist specialized in paleopathology who is also based at the Department of Life Sciences and the Research Center for Anthropology and Health at the University of Coimbra. Pluralizing the Anthropocene is an online colloquium that builds on a creative partnership between several institutions representing the arts, the sciences and the humanities. The Research Center for Anthropology and Health, the Fundação de Serralves, the research network SciTech Asia, the Center for Functional Ecology, Science for People and the Planet and the Department of Life Sciences at the University of Coimbra. We would like to thank these institutions for making this colloquium possible. Many thanks also to the members of the Serralves technical team for their wonderful support. Serralves is, is a leading global cultural institution known for its role in promoting public debates on topics that matter to everyone. And this colloquium, I guess it's a wonderful example of this mission. Public response to this colloquium has been overwhelming. Almost 2,000 people altogether have registered for this talk, including people from many different countries and professional backgrounds. I would like to thank everyone for their continuing support. When Ana Luisa and myself started designing this colloquium sometime last year, our goal was to create an open and multivocal and international forum of debate on important issues that are not getting as much attention as they should. The world's attention at the moment is almost exclusively focused on tackling a global pandemic that has proved far more deadly than initially predicted. But the COVID-19 pandemic, as renowned Brazilian indigenous activist and leader Ailton Krenak has recently noted, should be taken as a reminder of the increasing environmental uncertainties shaping everyday lives around the world. Perhaps more than ever before, we need to stop for a moment and think more seriously about how to handle these increasing environmental uncertainties of which the COVID-19 pandemic is only a byproduct. It's a matter of sustainability of everyone and everything. The world we live in is very different from that of our grandparents and great grandparents. It's warmer, drier, more polluted, and if the trend of ruination continues, it's more than likely that we will compromise the livability of the planet for the future generations. The current production and consumption system has brought many benefits to a large number of people and populations around the world, even if with significant inequalities. But it has also led to unprecedented levels of environmental destruction and to a conjuncture of global warming and climate change with increasingly visible effects. The present decade, the third of the 21st century, will be decisive when it comes to addressing these issues and planning a little bit better the future of our communities. Before we plunge into a conjuncture of chaos, confusion and rising inequalities even more disturbing than what we are currently witnessing under the current pandemic. There are, of course, many people around the world who are denying the relevance of many of these concerns. But even these people cannot really ignore ongoing debates of envir on environmental destruction, climate change, and the future of the planet. These are the biggest challenges of the epoch we live in, the Anthropocene, or the age of humans. 
The term Anthropocene was coined by the late atmospheric scientist Paul Crutzen in a conference sometime in 2000 to highlight the role of human activities in climate change. The term was then appropriated by geologists to refer to the present geological era as a period in which humans have become one of the most potent geophysical forces in the planet and their activities, of course, leading to increasing environmental uncertainties. We are now in 2021 and Paul Crutzen died earlier this year, and there is still no consensus within the geophysical sciences on the validity of the term Anthropocene, just as there is no consensus on the precise beginning of the, ter of the Anthropocene as a geological era. But most scholars would agree that the environmental impact of the human planetary expansion has become increasingly visible after the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, and in particular, after the great global acceleration that took place after World War II. In the last two decades, the term Anthropocene has gained increasing popularity beyond the geophysical sciences, entering the humanities, the social sciences and the arts, as well as the media, and leading to the development of critical alternative terms like Capitalocene and many other all of which defined in relation to the original concept of the Anthropocene. Whichever way we look at the concept, the Anthropocene has entered global, cultural and political imaginaries as some kind of hyper object or magnet that helps capture the tensions and anxieties of the age we live in. An age that is marked by increasing uncertainties about the future of human life on the planet. But the Anthropocene is not just about a runaway world of uh, environmental doom. It is also about overcoming disaster and catastrophe and creating new visions of hope and justice. The realities of environmental pollution, anthropogenic climate change, species extinction and sea level rise compel a reimagining of humanity's place in the world and an urgent rethinking of the dominant forces threatening the ecological balance of the planet. A rethinking that must go beyond make do patchwork interventions like green capitalism or technological solutions solutionism. Using the term Anthropocene to refer to the current age of increasing environmental uncertainties has started a new conversation about what needs to be done. But it has also generated a monolithic understanding of the Anthropocene as a unified human experience. The framing of the Anthropocene around the universalizing species paradigm has a harmony homogenizing effect that hides significant exclusions and inequalities. Not all humans are equally implicated in the major forces driving contemporary human environmental crisis. And not all humans and hardly any non-humans are invited into the conceptual spaces where these disasters are theorized or responses to disaster formulated. If we really want to do something to change the current global economic system, we need to be capable of developing a more inclusive conversation and we need to be capable of building a global economy that is no longer focusing focused on conquering nature, but on learning how to coexist with the plurality of life forms around us. This series features well known scholars committed to developing a more inclusive and diverse understanding of Anthropocene debates of resilience, adapta adaptation and the struggle for environmental justice. Every talk will be followed by an informal conversation and Q&A session with the audience via the chat function. The chat function is currently closed, but it will be open towards the end of the talk. If you would like to ask a question, please prepare your question and have it ready to be posted in the chat box once the Q&A session starts. This talk will be conducted in English. If you need language assistance, Microsoft Teams has a live transcript function that can be activated by pressing the live transcript symbol that should be located in the right bottom corner of the application. A number of languages are available via this functionality, so please feel free to activate it. Please bear in mind that this event is being recorded by Sahavs and will be later released for public viewing via social media and the internet. The videos of the four previous sessions of Pluralizing the Anthropocene are already available in Sahavs YouTube channel. But let me go back to the main reason why we are all here today. So let me start by introducing our speakers. 
I will start with um, Yifei Li. Yifei is an assistant professor in environmental studies at NYU Shanghai and global network assistant professor at NYU. His research concerns both the macro level implications of Chinese environmental governance for state society relations, marginalized populations and global ecological sustainability, as well as the micro level bureaucratic processes of China's state interventions into the environmental realm. He is the co-author with Judith Shapiro of China Goes Green, Coercive Environmentalism for a Troubled Planet. Judith Shapiro is director of the Masters in Natural Resources and Sustainable Development for the School of International Service at the American University and chair of the Global Environmental Politics Program. She was one of the first Americans to live in China after US-China relations were normalized in, in 1979. She is the author, co-author or editor of nine books, including with Yi Fei Li, China Goes Green, Coercive Environmentalism for a Troubled Planet, published by Polity in 2020, China's Environmental Challenges, by, published by Polity also in 2016, and Mao's War Against Nature, published in 2001, amongst many other uh, publications in what is a very distinguished career within China studies. In our first session of Pluralizing the Anthropocene, Tim Ingle argued that the global economic system must be rebuilt around a more encompassing notion of sustainability, the sustainability of everything. In our second session, anthropologist Anit Singh called for a more plural, historically expanded understanding of the Anthropocene. And she made a compelling case for the need to rewrite the history of modern environmental destruction from a more than human perspective. In our third session, anthropologist Agustin Fuentes took this more than human perspective to another level by bringing into focus the ecologies of despair and hope, shaping the relations between humans and other animals in the Anthropocene. In our fourth session, biologist Elena Freitas talked about the need to respect nature and the challenges of developing international polycentric frameworks of governance capable of promoting nature conservation and reverting current global trends of environmental degradation. Today, social scientists Yifei Li and Judith Shapiro will take pluralizing the Anthropocene to China, inviting us to look at the challenges of the Anthropocene from a different perspective. What does it mean for the future of the planet when one of the world's superpowers and one of the world's most durable authoritarian governance systems pursues, quote, ecological civilization, unquote? What are the promises and the pitfalls of Chinese green authoritarianism? Yifei and Judith, I am truly delighted to have you here with us. Thank you so much for joining us. Ladies and gentlemen, Yifei Li and Judith Shapiro, China Goes Green, Coercive Environmentalism for a tro Troubled Planet. Yifei and Judith, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Gonzalo, for your very, very generous introduction and for your thoughtful opening framing remarks about the whole series. Um, and I think, you know, we're just very, very honored to be part of this um, collective global rethinking about the Anthropocene, as you um, so articulately pointed out. And we're just grateful for all the audience members for joining today. Um, Judy would also like to thank everybody. Over to Judy. Yes, I would like to um, both thank everybody and also express my frustration that I'm not able to be in Coimbra in person. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it's really an honor to be here. It's been wonderful to work with Gonzalo and the other members of the team to set this up. And we're really excited to be here and hope that our contribution will um, add to the overall conversation. So Ife is going to um, start. He's going to handle the slide sharing. Okay, um, well, so China Goes Green, Coercive Environmentalism for a Troubled Planet is both the title of the book that Judy and I wrote together and the title of our presentation today. Um, this is uh, the cover um, artwork for our book. We just wanted to give you a sense of um, what it looks like. If you want to uh, get a copy, this will be the material that you'll be looking for. 
But before we delve into the substance of our presentation today, we want to give you a sense of who we are as authors and how we came together to work on this project. Over to Judy. Yeah, so I hope you can see that I haven't changed a bit. Um, and this picture comes from 1979 when I was one of the very first Americans to teach and live in China after US-China relations were normalized. And so my career has spanned a long time and I've seen a lot of changes in China. Here I'm doing my best to blend in. And um, I was lucky to be short and dark haired and um, have uh, two braids. So yeah, that's me as a young girl. Over to Ife. Uh and if uh, the spelling of my name is not self-evident already, uh, I am of Chinese descent. I was born and raised in this great city of Shanghai, and I now teach at NYU Shanghai. Uh, the picture on the left, I hope you can tell, is me, and the picture on the right-hand side of the screen is the house in which I grew up. Um, for those of you who know the geography of Shanghai, you might have uh, recognized this building already. It's at the intersection of Henan Road and Nanjing Road uh, in downtown Shanghai. Over to yeah. Judy. Yeah, so we want to talk a little bit about how we came to write this book. And our sense has been that uh, many of us are very frustrated that the international system doesn't seem adequate to the challenges that the planet is facing often we feel as if somehow democracies are messy and they take too long and especially with trump you know there were all those setbacks and so sometimes there's a fantasy somehow that maybe what the world needs is a green dictator. <laughs> and we wanted to investigate that, and we want to see what that looks like on the ground. Um, I think we um, have a sense that um, things are not always what they're cracked up to be, but this is an example of the kind of uh, quotation that we see where, you know, ecological civilization sounds so fabulous, and this very commonly reproduced quotation from Xi Jinping about green, clear waters and green mountains being gold and silver, you know, is um, really typical. Um, I think Ife wants to explain a little bit about the um, ideological significance of ecological civilization. Indeed, uh, one of the things that um, tends to go unnoticed sometimes is that a lot of Western observers tend to just dismiss this notion of ecological civilization as a propagandist's invention coming out of China. Uh, we don't think we're so ready to just dismiss this notion out of hand. Um, because we think ecological civilization seems to mean a lot of different things to top leaders in China. Um, for one, they're saying that prior to the arrival of the Europeans through the Opium War and the imperial invasions that followed, China was a great civilization and China had been a great civilization all along, but it somehow fell into uh, a decline since European arrival in the 1840s. Um, and the Chinese Communist Party very much sees itself as a great force of civilizational revival. We hear these notions such as the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation and so on and so forth that suggests precisely how the Chinese Communist Party is seeing itself. And in this context, Ecological civilization fits in neatly in the sense that the Chinese Communist Party isn't just aspiring to build any kind of civilizational leadership. They're building a very, very specific kind of ecological civilizational leadership that simply has never been attempted before. Now, in this sense, environmental protection in general and perhaps climate change in particular represents um, a rather important core foundational element of the Chinese communist leadership. And as such, we think it's important to understand how exactly does the Chinese leadership accomplishes this notion of ecological civilization. But before we do that, we want to give you a sense of the extent of pollution that is happening on the ground in China. Over to Judy. Mm -hmm. So we're going to run through a few slides relatively quickly um, just to give you a sense of the ground, um, the ground work. Um, 
Now, this one is interesting because um, Shanghai is the Paris of the Orient and all of this, and there were 16,000 pigs who died of a porcine virus, and they were dumped into the feeder river that um, supplies Shanghai's drinking water. So what we get, I think there's maybe one more of these, what we get is a sense that the ordinary Chinese people are afraid of uh, the quality of their food, they're afraid to breathe the air, they're afraid to drink the water. And so, um, you know, there's a sense of impatience and urgency that the Chinese Communist Party should take the leadership in cleaning this up. Um, otherwise, the legitimacy is at stake. And I just want to make one more point about this. This is a very famous image. Um, as we think about the uh, fouling, if you will, of China's nest. It's easy to blame China for making such a mess of their beautiful environment. But um, remember that so much of this pollution is actually due to a displacement of environmental harm from developed countries to developing countries, specifically China, as China became the manufacturing hub of the world. So much of China's pollution is actually the pollution that belongs to the West. I've always I like to tell a story. Sometimes I'm with Chinese delegates in um, or friends in America, and they'll look up at the blue sky and the puffy white clouds, and they'll say, "How did you do this? How did you clean up the environment?" And the actual answer, the honest answer, is that we displaced all the um, pollution onto China. So this is interesting because, in a way, it's a defunct uh, or out of date image in that China is now refusing to take uh, the e-waste from the West as of January this year. Indeed, um, and this uh, picture gives us uh, a different look of the exact same problem that Judy just described. Now, what this image shows is that China has been the destination of a cumulative 45 percent of the world's total plastic waste since 1992. In other words, almost half of the global uh, plastic waste has ended up in China in the last two decades or more. This simply shows the scale of the global pollution that ended up in China and the real challenge of mitigating the negative externalities of global economic production. Now, having uh, set the stage of um, China as an empirical case and the real environmental challenges that are faced with, um, uh, that Chinese citizens are faced with, we wanted uh, now to give you a very quick overview of the book in general. Now, this slide shows you the table of contents. We won't have the time to go through all of them, but we think it's important for, uh, for us to, to show uh, in general the progression of the chapters and how these different chapters fit together. Uh, the book itself is bookended by an introduction at the beginning and a conclusion at the end. The middle four chapters, the substantive four chapters begins with a look at uh, environmental governance in the industrial eastern parts of the country. We then move in chapter two to the western borderlands of the country and examine how Chinese rulers and government officials began to deal with ethnic minority populations and the western borderlands in ways that, that may be similar to how they deal with uh, environmental issues in the eastern industrial areas, but also in some ways uh, may be more intensified or perhaps even more aggressive. Then after that in chapter three, we move further out spatially to examine the Chinese state, both in terms of state political authority and state-backed capital investments on what's known as the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, initially across the Eurasia continent, across the Indian Ocean to Africa, but now really growing to encompass a much wider range of spatial coverage. And after that, in chapter four, we look into China's interventions into the global commons by focusing on issues such as trade uh, and China's atmospheric engineering efforts. So now that uh, we've given you a sense of the overall spatial and logical progression of the book, we want to delve into some of the examples so that you can gain an understanding of, of the, the fundamental empirical basis of our argument in the book. Over to Judy. 
But so one thing we wanted to underline is that we did try to be to find both positive and negative examples. But one of the themes that we found was that there's a tendency for China's environmental policy to be very top down, rather technocratic, um, sometimes experienced by the recipients as uh, arbitrary and sudden, um, without a lot of public consultation, without a lot of um, um, public buy-in before they're implemented. So one of the um, typical techniques that the Chinese state uses is what we call campaigns. And they've been doing campaigns, as you probably know, since the Yan'an years and certainly during the Mao period. Now they do these campaigns occasionally to make sure that the skies are blue in major cities whenever there's a high level meeting. So this was fame and the ordinary people laugh about it, right? So the 2008 Olympics, they called it Olympics blue. And then 2014, the APEC meeting, it's APEC blue and so on and so forth. So here we have a, you know, a decoration that ironically simply um, serves to remind the ordinary Chinese people that the skies indeed are not blue. And um, so one of the impacts of these campaigns is that ordinary people sometimes feel as if, um, you know, the, the state cares more about face and outsiders than they do about ordinary people who during these blue campaigns are forced to um, shut down the factories, they're forced not, they're not able to drive their cars, they're not able to, to burn funeral money for their dead parents, these kinds of things. And um, so this campaign style governance is very typical of Chinese environmentalism. We're going to do another no. one. Now we want to move uh, to give you a concrete example of how a, con a campaign style environmental governance actually looks like and feels like on the ground. Um, this is a picture of uh, a lot of garbage collection bins, uh, garbage bins in uh, the city of Shanghai. Now the chances are that if you, any of you in the audience visit the city of Shanghai and go into any of the residential neighborhoods, these will be the kind of garbage bins that you see. Now, one of the things that obviously is very noticeable here is that they're locked up. You might be asking why, why, why are they locked up? Um, they're locked up because the city introduced a new recycling campaign at the beginning of last year. Uh, as, as a part of the recycling campaign, the city asks its citizens to only dispose of trash within a two hour window in the morning and a two hour window in the afternoon. If you can't make it back home during these designated time slots, you simply will be dumping trash illegally, as you can see on the picture, which is exactly what a lot of people are doing. Even if you can make it back home on time within these four hour windows every day, the chances are that when you go and try to dispose of your garbage, someone will be going through them, or better still, someone will be holding a camera to actually make sure that everything in your bags are exactly being classified according to the specification of the city government. Now, a lot of people argue that there are environmental benefits to doing these uh, things. And, I, and Judy and I obviously agree that there are noticeable, measurable environmental benefits to doing so. But there are also a lot of hidden risks that aren't being accounted for in campaigns like this. Now, one hidden risk is that prior to the introduction of the recycling campaign, it wasn't like the city did not have a recycling sector. It did. These mom and pop uh, operations on these flatbed tricycles have been going around the city from one street to another to collect all sorts of recyclables from ordinary citizens and firms. Now that the city wants to take over this entire sector, they end up pushing out these mom and pop operations um, from existence. And at the same time, they inconvenience the everyday lives of the citizens. This is um, a piece of artwork that was commissioned by The Economist when they reviewed China Goes Green. And we felt that this uh, is a, an accurate representation of the kind of cases that we describe, especially in uh, chapter two of the book, where individuals are doing these apparently environmental, apparently beneficial um, behaviors. And yet 
these environmental behaviors are under the watchful eyes of the state through all these cameras. And in fact, in the city of Beijing, we know for a fact that many of the trash cans are now outfitted with facial recognition cameras to even further its surveillance of the citizens' behaviors. Over to Judy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so just to add there, um, so what we're seeing is that these environmental um, techniques are actually intensifying state control over the individual. And in some cases, how you recycle will contribute to your social credit score or diminish your social credit score. So that's a level of, um, I would say, in state intrusion into, um, say, uh, personal privacy that's quite intense. All right, I'm not going to read this, but this is the other, another technique that the state uses, which is to be very quantitative in setting targets that um, low level and middle level officials must meet. Now, the way the state is, the bureaucracy is set up, these middle and lower level officials are looking upwards all the time to find out if they're going to get um, promoted or if they're going to get a salary increase and so on and so forth. So you can see, I mean, this one I love, you know, the, I don't love it, but I mean, this one is a great example um, that forest cover rate should be 23.04%, you know, so specific, so quantitative. And so ironically, um, here's a good example of how sometimes this can go awry. Um, a couple summers ago in Hunan province, when they were trying, the local officials were trying to meet an air pollution target, and they found that whenever the farmers used their threshing machines, pollution spiked really high. And so they forbade the farmers from using threshing machines that summer, and the whole um, harvest was wasted. So this is an example of how sometimes these um, techniques that seem to be green techniques can end up harming the vulnerable and catching people in a net where it's not intended originally to be caught. Yeah. Over to Ife. Um, we then in the book move further out to the western borderlands of China. Um, and in this uh, slide, what you see is in fact images that show various aspects of what's known as the Lowe's Plateau in the middle of the country in China. Um, the top two images actually show very much a success story in the rehabilitation of the Lowe's Plateau starting from circa 1991-1992. It was such a huge success in large part because the Chinese government at the time was working very, very closely with the World Bank and enabled a large group of World Bank experts that consisted of sociologists, ecologists, economists, and, and forest scholars to come together and they spent two years doing a fact-finding mission, going from village to village and try to understand people's recollections of whatever they did to the ecological environment that worked or what they did that led to the degradation of the environment. In two years, they didn't intervene in any concrete way, but through a fact-finding mission, they were able to achieve a very deep thorough and comprehensive understanding of not only the ecology, but also the social support system and the economic livelihood considerations that characterize the Los Plateau. And in the end, by the end of about uh, 1992, they came up with this very comprehensive rehabilitation plan that made social, ecological, and economic senses all at the same time, which as you can see on the right-hand image, let to the improvement um, of the ecological condition in the Los area. However, in the haste to replicate, quote unquote, this initial success story, local government looked at the rehabilitation and decided for themselves that the most visible element and perhaps the, the easier, uh, the, the most easily replicable element of the rehabilitation plan was, was tree planting. And they embarked on this massive monocultural tree planting effort across the Los Plateau in Inner Mongolia and even further out in the uh, northern China plains to plant all these trees, um, thousands and tens of thousands of trees. And oftentimes we document to be poplar trees. Now, initially, you can see on, on this image to the lower left that these trees gave people a sense that these afforestation uh, undertakings were successful. But within just two years or sometimes even less, 
um, these trees, because they don't belong to the local ecological habitat and they have very deep root systems which suck up a lot of underground water. In the end, within a year or two, they intensify the, the problem of desertification and therefore worsened the ecological condition. Now, the upshot of the story is that the initial success was really attributable to how the Chinese state opened up to a wide range of stakeholders and actors and solicited inputs from all of them. And then the later failure to uh, replicate, quote unquote, the initial success was out of this authoritarian imperative to do things quickly, to do things rapidly, um, to uh, oftentimes do things without consulting the general public and the peoples whose lives are affected by these large scale state interventions. But Judy has another examples to share with you. Yeah, so this is actually one of the reasons I wanted to write the book. And in, in addition to the fact that, you know, there seems to be some kind of romance about eco, um, environmental authoritarianism. This is an example of what the Chinese call ecological migration. And I started to hear about ecological migration maybe 20 years ago. Um, sounds so nice, right? You migrate for the ecology. It sounds really good. It's not. It's forcible um, resettlement of nomadic people. It's part of a long um, tradition that the Chinese state has been struggling with to try to so-called pacify the borderlands and settle the frontiers. And so, you know, James Scott, the um, anthropologist, has pointed out in his classic book, Seeing Like a State, that in general, states don't like nomads, not only China, you know, whether it's Marsh Arabs or the Roma Gypsies or whatever, states don't like nomads because they're not, in Scott's words, legible. They don't settle down, you can't tax them, you can't make them, you know, do military service, et cetera. Um, but um, so much of China, I mean, this incredible amount of China, maybe a third of China, Tibet, Xinjiang, Inner Mongolia is populated by people who are fundamentally pastoralists who move their animals from place to place. And in some ways, the ecology of these regions is co-created between the people, the landscapes, and the animals. Um, but the Chinese decided that now, the Han Chinese decided that um, with more and more in migration, more and more Han moving in, more and more animals moving in, that they could blame the animals for their sh with their sharp hooves for tearing up the grasslands. And in the name of environmental protection, they decided to put these nomads into settlements that you see here and um, that they should be grateful, you know, they should be given a couple of dollars and um, a flush toilet and, um, you know, and then the town will be puzzled why these people aren't more grateful. Um, so ecological migration has been a controversial um, plan, um, not only in among Westerners who have observed it, but also among Chinese scholars and anthropologists as well. Um, often the people don't do very well over a period of time. Um, there are a lot of social problems and um, ultimately the grasslands also suffer. So this is not actually, um, this is actually going to intensify because the Chinese right now are creating an enormous um, area of national park called Sanjiang Yuan, or you know the Three Rivers um, field, and um, it's a larger than Yellowstone and Yosemite combined. And there are a tremendous number of people who live in this area. So there's a lot of uncertainty as to whether these people will be forced out of the park boundaries, whether they will be allowed to stay under certain conditions. Um, so, you know, we have to watch this kind of thing. Again, you know, we're all for biodiversity conservation. It's terribly important. But um, if it's done at the cost of um, human rights um, and in effect ethnic, uh, ethnic, I don't know what, want to use a nice word, but the deprivation of people of their ethnic identities, um, then we have to really watch it very carefully and see whether the benefits are worth the costs. Over to mm -hmm. Ife. Great. Um, so we want to uh, pause for a little bit before we move on to other examples to think more concretely about 
um, how we can contribute to the theme of this series, pluralizing the Anthropocene. And we want to highlight how um, not only in the uh, few examples that we just described and, uh, and, and the ones that we will be describing in a minute, but also across all these cases that we've documented in our book from China's industrial east to its western borderlands, the Belt and Road and Global Commons, there is this common pattern of not only environmental, but also social and economic success when the Chinese state is able to pluralize um, its, uh, the process by which decisions are made. When a plurality, in other words, of actors and uh, uh, stakeholders are involved, when a plurality of agency is being incorporated into the decision-making process, the chances are that the state simply gets to know the state of a, the world a little better, um, they get to know the state of the challenge a little better, and they also get to know the wide range of solutions um, that come from different walks of life. So here we, we want to highlight really the role of independent NGOs, independently minded scientists, citizen scientists, even journalists, lawyers, filmmakers, student advocacy groups, and startup firms, and how all these actors have done um, a tremendous amount of work in holding Chinese state actors accountable, but also in holding polluters, in holding uh, actors that are doing all the environmental damage accountable uh, through all kinds of activities that they have committed themselves to. Judy. Oh, yeah. Okay, so we'll move um, now to the question of um, the global impacts, the global environmental impacts of China's rise. And I think they can be divided into three baskets. Um, first of all, we know that traditional Chinese medicine has been drawing on wildlife ever since its inception thousands of years ago. But until the last few decades, ordinary Chinese people couldn't afford to buy the um, ingredients and the products. And so now that China is rich, I mean, it is really literally rich. Um, there, that has put tremendous pressure on global biodiversity and endangered species, particularly tiger, sharks, rhinos, pangolins, deer, turtles, elephants. Um, and um, it also has underlined the um, risks involved in consumption of wildlife. So all of these zoonotic diseases, whether they're SARS, COVID, MERS, um, Ebola, you know, the, many of these diseases come from the consumption of wildlife. Um, so this is a really serious issue, right? M many of you probably don't know what a pangolin is. Please look it up. It's the it's it's a deer deer antelope, a deer deer ant eater, and um, the Chinese are importing these literally by the ton, um, by the ton. Um, the other basket we can look at is the resource extraction of um, raw materials. And um, some people talk about a second contradiction of capitalism, right? China is a very capitalist country and is running out of raw materials at home. So it needs raw materials. Capitalism needs raw materials to fuel its growth. That's the logic of capitalism. So they're going overseas to buy up grain and fossil fuels and all of this. They bought the anchovy fisheries of Peru, et cetera. And they're also all, capitalism is always looking for new markets. And all of this has tremendous environmental impacts. I do want to say one more thing about this. You know, sometimes people worry, oh, is China a new kind of colonialism or imperialism or something like that? And honestly, if we're on it, if we think about the Western tradition of imperialism and, um, and um, it, it's much, it was, it was carried out at the with a gun, right? And this Chinese imperialism, if it is Chinese imperialism, expansionism, it is at least done nominally legally, right? It's done through deals. Some of the deals may not be with the most um, lovely personalities, but um, it is um, certainly done through uh, contracts and um, on the open market. So finally, the Belt Road infrastructure projects, um, these ports, dams, pipelines, roads and railroads, power plants, you know, this is all part of uh, this kind of connectivity theme that the Belt and Road is supposed to be all about. Overall, I would say that um, to the extent that China is trying to green the Belt and Road, they tend to be focused very much on its carbon um, 
um, footprint and less aware of the fact that these infrastructure projects fragment landscapes, which has tremendous biodiversity implications. So there's a technocratic um, quality to um, their response to the criticism that the Belt and Road Initiative has ended up exporting a lot of fossil fuel, um, coal-fired power plants, um, and so on and so forth. So I think we're over to Ife. Oh no, it's still me. Okay, um, so here's an example of um, citizen activism. This is not an ordinary citizen. This is the basketball Ife, um, Yao Ming, um, but Yao Ming has lent his name to the anti- um, shark fin consumption campaign, which has been incredibly successful. And now he's part of this elephant, the ivory belongs to elephants campaign, which is um, sponsored also by the international NGO Wild Aid. Um, I just wanted you to have this picture because it's adorable. Um, next, I think is Ife. Yep. Uh, so, so Judy almost said, said that was Ife. Some people <laughs> did say that I have some resemblance to, you know, the basketball star Yao Ming. So, so, so I give you a point for that. Um, but in, in terms of the Belt and Road in general, I think what this picture really helps us illustrate is the, the idea of wing wing developmentalism. So wherever China goes on the Belt and Road, even further into the global commons, this notion of China pursuing wing wing capital investments, resource extraction, bilateral technological transfer deals, it's always framed as a wing wing deal for both parties. Um, and yet it is extremely hard to actually evaluate the extent to which these deals did turn out to be win-win, in large part because almost exclusively Chinese investments on the Belt and Road materialize in the form of bilateral agreements between the Chinese government, a government agency, or a state-owned enterprise, and a state-owned enterprise or a large conglomerate firm or a government agency in the host country. Now, these bilateral agreements oftentimes are negotiated behind closed doors with rather limited transparency and accountability to the extent that whenever these actors, whether it's a Chinese state actor or it's a host country state actor or even local media, suggesting that these deals are leading to wing-wing outcomes, we simply have no way of evaluating the merits of these um, claims. And at the same time, when we look at the Belt and Road Initiative, a lot of scholars are arguing that the Belt and Road Initiative is, is something like a misnomer in the sense that there is not one belt, much less one road, but rather a, a, a multiplicity of belts and roads all over the Eurasia continent and increasingly expanding into what's known as the Polar Belt and Road or even the Space Belt and Road. In a separate article that Judy and I wrote outside of this book, we also describe issues such as the Dairy Belt and Road and the Tourism Belt and Road. We're indeed seeing the rapid growth of the Belt and Road to encompass a wider and wider range of developmental activities in the world. Now, one of the things that we want to draw people's attention to is that um, many commentators have pointed out these coal-fired power plants and how there seems to be um, a lot of uh, coal uh, and carbon implications of these Chinese investments on the Belt and Road. Um, and, and the Chinese state, I think, is becoming increasingly sensitive to that. But as Judy alluded to on an earlier slide, we think that the Chinese state will most likely diversify away from coal moving forward simply because of the global resistance. But one of the things we should be asking is what will they be diversifying into? If they diversify into other kind of developmental activities that have not necessarily carbon related environmental consequences, but the loss of biodiversity, uh, industrialization of dairy farms all over um, New Zealand, these will also contribute to long term ecological degradation in the planet. So thinking more concretely, once again, about pluralizing the Anthropocene, we think these bilateral frameworks on the Belt and Road really are not going to work because they give us a very tenuous basis for holding actors accountable. And especially as the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative um, moves further into Europe and already um, in, in Italy, 
it, it looks like a lot of Chinese state interests are now going to be up against established political institutions within the European Union. So what really remains to be seen is whether these multilateral uh, established institutions can be put to use in holding Chinese state investors to account environmentally as well as socially. Um, many of these other partnerships we've also documented uh, in the book to have a robust track record in holding state actors to account and oftentimes also in helping uh, government agencies to better manage the ecological environment. So, th so this notion of pluralizing institutions and all sorts of institutional partnerships in the Anthropocene is also one of the arguments that we really want to emphasize today. Judy. Yeah, so I want to give you just one example of uh, China sort of manipulating the global atmosphere. And this is just fascinating to me as an example of geoengineering. We saw earlier about the blue skies um, campaigns. Well, this is not just like a one week long uh, summit meeting. Here, um, the Chinese state is very worried about uh, climate change, maybe more so than your ordinary Chinese person who would be much more concerned about the public health impacts of the bad air, the bad water, the bad food. So here, the Chinese state is worried about glacier melt because in the short term, of course, there's flooding, but in the longer term, the aquifers that that serve even cities like Beijing are, are being depleted. So in order to try to fight that, they've... Um, They've embarked on a, uh, what they call a Sky River project um, to shoot silver iodide through multiple thousands and thousands of these machines. Um, they put them on this Tibetan plateau, and when the monsoons come up from India, they shoot silver iodide into the air, which somehow binds with the water particles and makes it rain, and therefore should replenish the glaciers. Now, we just don't know what the impacts of that would be on the monsoons on India's um, water supply. Um, we don't know how toxic silver iodide is. And we don't know, you know, what the long-term implications are of a state trying to manipulate the weather of an entire region. Um, so, of course, the image, you know, the source of this image is of some organization called Wonderful Engineering. But, um, yeah, I would say we should tread carefully here. Now, Indeed, to we should. Yeah, we should we should tread carefully. Um, one of the things um, I think the reader or, or the the audience members um, have heard a lot today is this notion of technocracy. Is is the notion of how these various examples that we document in the book show a very strong technocratic tendency on the part of Chinese state actors whenever they go out and um, operate, whether it's in the uh, western parts of China or the Belt and Road or into the global commons, the idea seems to be um, uh, implementing and, and really bringing what they consider to be an urban developmental success story, initially from China's industrial east to the western borderlands, and then gradually the Belt and Road and ultimately into the whole world. And all this seems not only technocratic in orientation, but also high modernist in its philosophical orientation. It's uh, it's material in uh, in 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 sort of uh, the organization of the consumer economy, and it's decidedly urban and oftentimes to the neglect of rural livelihoods. It's uh, it's it's focused on hard infrastructural investments instead of the actual connectivity of people. And in all of these dimensions, we think that what seems really detrimental is the idea that there can be only one vision of developmental success and that there can be only one version of what um, life in the Anthropocene, what human comfort in the Anthropocene, what human satisfaction in the Anthropocene can look like. And to challenge that, we once again go back to the theme of the conference and emphasize the need to really begin to pluralize these visions and begin to unsettle these established notions, these seemingly established notions of what success and satisfaction and flourishing might look like. 
Now, uh, we, we want to sort of uh, sit back a little bit and, and um, take stock of these various cases that we've examined um, today. We started out by trying to look for this thing that other scholars call authoritarian environmentalism. The idea that we use authoritarian means to accomplish environmental ends. If the ultimate goal of environmental protection is noble enough, then perhaps that goal can be used to justify the use of authoritarian means simply because we have to get there given the urgency of the climate crisis. However, um, against this background of the authoritarian environmentalism hypothesis, if you will, what we find through our investigation in the book is precisely the opposite. We're seeing the Chinese state systematically using environmental protection as a means to the end of authoritarian control. And by that, we mean the penetration of state authority domestically in China, um, the penetration of state power in, in the, the ethnic majority ways of life into ethnic majority, I'm sorry, ethnic minority areas of the country, and then onto the Belt and Road, gaining geopolitical leverage, gaining cultural influence uh, along the Eurasia continent into Africa and even into other parts of the world, and ultimately into the global commons, gaining a lot of leverage in, in even outer space or um, the atmosphere. To the extent that these cases have informed us about the exercise of state power, we have not seen much of authoritarian environmentalism, but rather what we document seems to be the pattern of what we call environmental authoritarianism. Over to Judy. Yeah, I guess a final or semi-final thought that we have is that we want very much to fight against the notion that so many people have that China is monolithic. Um, China is a very complex, there's a lot of people, 1.4 billion people, many different um, landscapes and many different actors, many different personalities, many different bureaucratic interests. So it's easy to generalize this Chinese state, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, the Ministry of Ecology and the Environment has a very different agenda than the Energy Administration. So um, we would encourage um, all of us to think about China in a more complex way. We would also here on the right hand side, we have a picture, I guess, of a landscape painting. And we would um, like to reflect on the fact that Chinese traditions are very complex as well, whether it's um, Buddhism, Confucianism, Taoism, they all have elements of sustainability in them. And then we have China's young people eagerly joining the kind of um, global uh, international environmental movement, um, wanting to be um, free thinking young people. So um, it's a very complex um, landscape there. And so let's just like pluralize China as much as we can. Exactly. Um, as, as much as we continue to hear what seems like an almost monopolizing narrative coming out of the Chinese state, and at the same time, let's not lose sight uh, with, with regard to what ordinary citizens in China are doing, whether in protesting polluting plants or whether in pursuing sustainability at the grassroots level. A lot Local, a lot of local activities are happening that may or may not align with what seems like an overpowering narrative coming out of the Chinese state. And to Judy's earlier point about different government agencies, um, the, the, the real challenge for, for a country like China is that different government agencies have different priorities and they have different interests. And oftentimes people assume that authoritarian environmentalism work because, well, with a snap of a finger, they can just make things happen. Now, once again, this oftentimes is not the case. We hear from agencies like the Ministry of Ecology and the Environment coming, again, coming out again and again, issuing really rigorous environmental standards and policy interventions. And yet, at the same time, they're up against a lot of uh, individuals and vested interests in agencies such as the General Energy Bureau of China or the Ministry of Commerce or even the Ministry of Foreign Affairs that seem to have a slightly higher standing with the Chinese bureaucracy when it comes to power struggles. So, so all of that is to really encourage um, members of the audience to think 
um, uh, about China not as a monolith, but as an entity that is internally very complex um, and has various interests, both in terms of what the people are thinking, the, what the history of the country really looks like, and also in terms of the exercise of political authority. Now, once again, we want to take this opportunity to thank um, our hosts and the technical team um, that is working tirelessly behind the scene. And we also want to thank the member of the audience. Uh, we look forward to interacting with you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Yifei and, uh, and Judith, for your very thought-provoking uh, talk. Um, I mean, I, I, I found your critique of what uh, I think at some point Judith is called the Romans of environmental authoritarianism very powerful. Um, you know, uh, some China experts uh, have highlighted in the last few years that uh, what they, they seem to be very impressed, so to speak, with China's singular determination to achieve national goals. I mean, noting that it is quite likely, given this national determination, that China will fulfill the pledge to become net carbon zero by 2060. Um, I mean, this gives a sense or, or, or speaks to a certain, certain anxieties around the world in different parts of the world about perhaps given the urgency of the questions that we're facing, perhaps we need to move forward in the direction of some form of authoritarian environmentalism. But as you show, this authoritarian environmentalist can turn very, very, very quickly into something more like what you call environmental authoritarianism. So I think there is no doubt uh, that the Chinese central government, I think, has the power and the long term planning capacity to accomplish impressive environmental goals. I mean, this has been shown and, and, there, and, there, and there are track records for this in, in, in some areas. But I think as you highlighted very well, there are also concerns about the negative costs and side effects of some of these top-down environmental policies. Um, my first question in a way has to do with, uh, with the future direction of China's framework of environmental governance. I mean, your talk provides a, a sort of a, a picture of uh, Chinese environmental governance that is sort of very top-down, very technocratic, two words that we heard a lot in your, in your talk and that it is experienced by ordinary citizens as some kind of sudden arbitrary form of intrusion in their ordinary lives. The government, in a way, you also show, has been trying to become the sole player in China's environmental governance, marginalizing non-state actors, in scientists, students, um, NGOs, journalists, and so on and so forth. In a way, we've seen this all before with other kinds of similar top-down policies. I mean, I'm thinking about the burst planning policy, for example, that in the 80s and 90s was particularly harsh and very authoritarian. So I suppose my question is, do you think that we're just talking about a stage of Chinese of China's framework of environmental governance and that we're heading towards a, a sort of a more pluralizing direction along the lines in a way that what happened with the burst planning policy that has become, you know, more uh, plural. Uh, the government has come to accept the need to engage with and accept the participation of multiple stakeholders in society and their involvement. Um, are there any signs that this is the way that we're heading? Are there any examples, for example, emerging of bottom-up sort of more inclusive conversations between the central government and other stakeholders in society. Uh, I would suggest perhaps to um, Yifei to, to, um, to, to take this question, yeah? Okay. And, uh, and, uh, um, and, then, and then Judith, if you want to add something, yeah? Okay, I'll, I'll say something real quick, and I, as I think this is an area that Judy, uh, Judy has a lot of expertise in. Um, you know, uh, Gonzalo, you, you asked about you know, if this period that we're documenting represents a transitional phase. Um, and and I'm, I'm thinking more concretely about some of the governance technologies that we have documented. For example, the social credit score or the surveillance, these facial recognition surveillance system that are being used. Now, these institutions are here to stay. These institutions aren't going away. 
And I have trouble seeing how a facial recognition camera system that basically covers all of Shanghai and, and, and for that matter, all of major cities all over China and how an all encompassing social credit score has the probability of actually reverting the process of surveillance and the penetration of state power over time. If anything, these these governmental technologies will continue to mature. They will continue to be applied in, in an even wider range of areas um, to a point of further enabling state authority to do what it has been doing. So if it's a transition, I fear it's a transition into an, an even more um, authoritarian phase. Although internationally, the picture may be a little more muddled. Um, Judy may have some other thoughts on that. Over to you. Yeah, I just want to add that um, over to me. Um, I just want to add that uh, some of these technologies have been exported to um, friendly authoritarian regimes like the IFE spent a lot of time in Abu Dhabi. Um, we hear about it in Ecuador as well. So these facial recognition technologies are um, being welcomed by um, authoritarian governments. But I want to go back to this question of civil society and just give you quickly um, uh, a sort of timeline of environmental civil societies opening and then contraction. Um, essentially in the mid 90s, um, the first environmental NGOs were formed. Um, they were very tentative. And then, you know, they, the movement grew with a brilliant and skillful and creative way of working under the yoke, if you will, of the Chinese state, partnering with elements of the Chinese state that were trying to green the country, um, coming up with all kinds of interesting apps like the um, everybody's favorite, the Smelly and Dirty Waters app, where you download that, you see a smelly and dirty water, <laughs> you know, river or some, and you take a picture and a G GPS locates you, and then the Ministry of Environment and, you know, the Environmental Ministry can then come down and investigate that. So that's an example of a kind of civil society and public participation. And so the range, I've done a couple of um, long articles about the range of, um, you know, strategies that are available um, using social social media. Um, but anyway, under the latest regime, the space for civil society has definitely contracted and um, it's much harder for foreign NGOs to work in China. They have to register directly with the Public Security Bureau. Um, domestic NGOs may continue to have some sorts of freedom. They really have to work very closely with the um, elements of the state that, you know, they partner with the state to to be the eyes and the, the um, eyes and ears of the state in some way, but um, they, you know, <laughs> they have to have tea with the ministry. They have to tea, tell them what they're up to, um, and they have to be cleverer and cleverer. So I think the space has contracted quite sharply. Okay, so um, and what about, for example, um, the contributions of? I mean, it, this is another civil society question. So. What about the views and the contributions of indigenous communities? I'm saying this because in the last few, in the last few months, a very unlikely uh, hero or perhaps anti-hero has emerged in a country the size of China and Brazil, a, an indigenous uh, leader and activist, Ailton Cranach, who just published a, a book or a couple of books, one of them entitled How to Postpone the End of the World. It's a great title mm -hmm. and has managed to get some, you know, a lot of attention in national media, you know, trying to kind of, you know, um, relate concerns with the COVID-19 pandemic um, faced by, you know, Brazilian mainstream society with, with the experience of, you know, indigenous communities who have been endangered for, you know, many decades al al already. So um, any signs of, of anything coming out of these indigenous um, communities, um, you know, what is the role of indigenous communities and scholars in, in, in national debates on, on the environment? Um, Judith, would you like to take this question? Yeah, yeah. I would, I would. Um, first of all, the concept of indigeneity doesn't exist really in Chinese. Um, they instead talk about ethnic minority nationalities and all of these regions are very much under pressure. Right, we know about what's going on in Xinjiang, right? We know what's been going on in Tibet. So for the Tibetans, um, there's, for example, 
a belief that the earth should not be cut into for mining purposes, or that sacred lakes and sacred rivers should not be dammed, or that sacred mountains should not be exploited for tourism. And yet, you know, it's all been monetized ever since they built the train um, into Tibet. So now tourism is booming. And, you know, I spent a little tiny bit of time in Tibet and, you know, Tibetans wept to me and they said, we sent our children to Nepal and Northern India so they could get a Tibetan education and we miss them so much. And can you take this money to them? And, you know, things like that. So um, there's really a loss of culture. So what happens then in terms of um, environmental activism is that they're at risk of being accused of being what the Chinese call splitists or you know separatists and it's even harder then to become an environmental activist if you're also a member of an ethnic minority nationality because they'll just put you in jail you know and that's it um, so I don't see I just don't see um, an environmental voice I mean they're there's environmental belief systems that are being violated in profound ways all the time now. Also in Inner Mongolia, huge problems with um, coal mining that are, you know, interfering with pastoral uh, migration routes. Um, but I don't see that kind of activism being possible in China. Would you like um, to add something on this or? Sure, you know, just as, as Judy was saying very briefly, I, I would add, um, you know, whenever we ask uh, these questions about China, one of the things I always challenge my students to think about is which China? Um, and, and, and to Judy's question, I think, you know, if we look at Taiwan, for example, there has been a lot of recent efforts to recognize the indigenous populations, and not only in terms of recognizing their existence per se, but also to actually spend time understanding their cultural repertoire, to understand what kind of philosophical um, ideas that are uh, deeply ingrained in um, their cultural practices and what kind of um, uh, sort of lessons can we learn from all of that. So perhaps looking at um, some of the success stories in Taiwan in managing um, a, a relatively um, equitable relationship between the ethnic majority of Han people and a, a very diverse group of indigenous populations could be a very good point to start. What about the role of Chinese intellectuals? Um, you know, is there are there any promising developments in terms of competing schools of thought? For example, what is the purchase of the concept of the Anthropocene? Renly Shi in China. I mean, I was surprised. We, we, um, I was surprised talking about this, this, uh, this concept recently with Chinese scholars. I was surprised that you know people were seemed to be very interested, especially in fields like philosophy of science, and so on and so forth. So, what is your experience in this in this matter? Is, are Chinese intellectuals talking about the Anthropocene? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well. Uh Chinese professors are talking about it, um, and, but that's pretty much it. <laughs> that, that I fear is unfortunately the reality. Um, I'm always very surprised, um, uh, you know, part of the arrangement of my employer, NYU Shanghai, um, is that 50% of our students are Chinese. The other 50% are non-Chinese. And I teach these introductory classes um, for our freshmen, uh, in which I introduce this idea of the Anthropocene. Um, what seems to be a robust pattern across all these years is that many of my American students, my European students, or even Australian students have just become very familiar with the notion of the Anthropocene or even the various debates about the Anthropocene. Um, some of them are even very well versed in the alternative words, right? Manthropocene, Manthropocene or capital scene, all of that. They, they don't have trouble calling up um, a lot of meaningful materials with, with, that's associated with the idea, even without actively learning anything yet in my classes. Whereas oftentimes to my Chinese students, uh, this seems like a completely new concept. Now maybe, uh, Gonzalo, as you pointed out, is, is the awkward translation in, into the Chinese language that perhaps did play a role, but at the same time, 
Um, for those for those of you in, in in the audience who are interested, you might you might want to look up this story that uh, that Bloomberg Environment published maybe a month or two ago about the Chinese educational system's treatment of climate change and environmental disasters. There is this idea that uh, the standard national curriculum is imposing on the students um, this this discourse that climate change is happening, but climate solution is going to come from the Chinese government. So nothing to worry about for the people. So long as the people of China listen to what the government tells them to do, uh, the climate crisis is going to go away. Um, this seems to have been developed into a rather standard treatment um, in the curriculum. Now, I, I've been out of um, Chinese schools for a very long time, um, but knowing that um, has been um, incorporated into the curriculum worries me a lot because it, it simply um, leaves our students and leaves the younger generation with a very limited amount of political efficacy when it comes to uh, environmental issues. They need to feel empowered to do a lot. And yet when you tell them, well, don't do anything, keep consuming. Um, and listening to the state. Now, that really uh, is a very worrisome sign. Judy, would like would you like to add something on this issue? No, no, no. I, Ife did a great job. OK, so I, I would propose this to start opening up and getting some questions from the from the audience because questions are piling up um, and, uh, you know, they are very diverse already. And one has to do actually with this issue of education that, uh, that Ife was just uh, pointing out and the, the impact of this sort of brain environmental brainwashing going on in, um, in China. So Chinese environmentalism seems to center around a host of pseudo coercive technocratic measures implemented and orchestrated by a number of central governmental authorities. This is a question by, by Marco, by the way. In which way, if any, do you think these pseudo coercive measures manage to change individuals? Is it simply a matter of forcing individuals to possibly grudgingly conform to ecological rules? Or do you think these pseudo coercive ma measures manage to bring about profound changes in the way individuals perceive themselves and their place in the environment? And do you think it is important for individuals to change the way they perceive themselves and their relationship with the environment? Uh, to achieve a uh, long-lasting, effective, beneficial environmental effects? It's a complicated question, but it's a question about education and the impact of, um, you know, authoritar authoritarian uh, policies um, in society. Um, I, I can start, yeah, yeah, I can start, um, but I'm sure Judy will have a lot to say about that. Um, but just to you know, answer concretely, maybe with examples, when the Shanghai government introduced this highly intrusive recycling mandate, um, it had the unfortunate consequence of antagonizing an entire population. People are thinking that, well, your environmentalists are really annoying. Um, they won't blame the government. They blame the environmental cause and they blame people like me who advocate for environmental activities. They somehow now associate environmental protection with all that intrusion into their lives that they have to deal with every day. So to the extent that these coercive measures have been implemented on, on such wide scales, I would say to Marco's question that it has the, the counterintuitive effect of uh, taking people even further away from the environmental cause simply because of the, the very real inconvenience that they have to deal with. Judy? Yeah, yeah, and I feel very torn in answering this question because um, on the one hand, I feel, um, yeah, feel sometimes that especially young Chinese people, they love the earth, you know, there's a sweetness and a kind of, you know, sh the earth is our mother and what we're doing is so wrong. And, um, you know, in some ways being more deep, eco deep ecologists than I would expect to find among my students in the United States. Um, and this technocratic thing, I've done a lot of teaching and lecturing in China over the years and at one point, well, it seemed like every time I'm put on a lecture tour in China, they always take me to environmental engineering schools, right? 
that you never understand environmental issues as being social or political or all engineering schools. And then when I'm in these engineering schools lecturing about, say, Chinese civil society or a group like Friends of Nature, these lovely, lovely people who are working on the environment, you know, but they're doing wastewater treatment plants or something. They say, I have no idea this even exists. How can I join this NGO, you know? So there's this kind of funny split. Um, and I think the one last thought, uh, I recently had to sort of review a film called Smog Town. And it's about um, an environmental protection official who's trying to implement this, this pollution, air pollution laws. And, you know, the ordinary people look at them as um, like they have to dodge them and they're in there shutting down the the uh, economic activities of these small scale businesses and um, there's no explanation given. So these guys are definitely seen as the enemy. The environmental protection people are definitely the enemy and these environmental protection people are sweating, so nervous, so afraid they're not gonna meet the target and indeed, by the end of the film, you know, the local mayor loses his job because they didn't meet the target. So, you know, it's all it's 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 you know, if they did some more work explaining things and putting people on board, I think they would do a lot better. <laughs> uh, we also have a question from uh, Maria on the perceptions of urban residents on the environmental camp camp campaign, some, some, some of which you, you described in your presentation, yeah. Uh, she asks, do they understand today, the, the, the urban residents, do they understand the importance of measures to their survival in the cities? Do they comply with measures? Do they rebel against the intrusion of state? Uh, does, do they become rebels against the measures by becoming less environmentally friendly? Um, she says that, uh, as a side note, that environmental authoritarianism can actually be a shoot in the foot for global campaigns for the environmental conservation. Would you like to um, answer that? Perhaps Ife, would you like to take this one? Yeah, thank you. Uh, okay, I'm just noting down the noting down the keywords, but I've I've got a few different things going on in my head hearing this question. One is that um, ordinary citizens um, pick up what James Scott termed um, weapons of the week, right? When the state comes and tells you, well, there are only four hours a day in which you can legally dispose of trash. Well, people go under the cover of darkness at night and <laughs> throw away their trash, supposedly illegally, but um, the state has no way of enforcing any of that. So we're seeing a lot of um, evasion, if you will, a lot of circumvention of these coercive rules. People just have to get very creative to circumvent all of these coercive interventions um, into citizen lives. But at the same time, um, one, of, one of the things that, that seems uniquely interesting about China is that um, there, there doesn't seem to be any climate activism. People are, people have very limited concern about climate change not because people aren't environmentally conscious, but because people's everyday experience in China are much more overshadowed by the immediate threat of air pollution, water pollution, and soil contamination, to a point where if you ask an ordinary Chinese citizen, do you care about climate change? Their immediate, their, their most likely response would be, yes, I do. But then you ask them, what is, China, what is climate change to you? They would say, isn't that just another term for air pollution? Um, SubChina actually did a, a survey uh, a few years ago that showed something like 78% of Chinese respondents that they surveyed thought that climate change and air pollution meant the same thing in practice. So that tells us a lot about um, sort of how the perception of urban citizens is very much overwhelmed by their everyday experience under um, a, a very, very degraded ecological environment. Okay, can I just intervene here? I'm going to read a comment from a, a viewer that has speaks directly to what Yifei is saying, and then perhaps Judy would like to comment on this. Uh, it's anonymous, but well, actually uh, the viewer writes um, the name in the, in the comment. So thanks Professor Lee and Professor Judy for such an enlightening presentation. My name is uh, Fan Ni. I am a PhD student in Ecocritical Literary Studies, currently studying at University of Western Australia. 
I have been recently reading Professor Judy's book, Mao's War Against Nature. It seems to me that the Chinese government's anthropocentric technocratic way has persisted from the Mao's era's socioeconomic campaigns to the present. It seems to me as a Chinese that the general public lack an ecological awareness by simply nudging everything to the state or to state power. Many people simply buy in the naive idea that environmentalism equals tree planting. Behind the anthropocentric authoritarian environmental actions, uh, it seems to me that nationalism discourse is the biggest obstacle to the pluralizing effort by being the hegemonic political correctness, as was also mentioned in both of your answers. What do you think? I suppose, I, could you, would you like to give a comment, Judith, on this um, interesting reflection? Yeah, well, first of all, I want to thank him for reading my book. <laughs> and um, that has been a, a question that I've um, been asked a lot, right? Because um, my early work focused on the Mao period, and then in so many ways, the environment got so much worse under capitalism. Um, and so what are the threads that um, connect these two periods? And certainly, as he says, um, or she says, uh, we don't know, um, that these themes of political repression or top-down policy making campaigns um, willingness of the state to forcibly reorder people um, all of these these themes carry over um, but i it sounds a little bit as if um you know i think it's not the people's fault um i think they're not voluntarily sort of abdicating responsibility to the state. What happened, you know, just in broad brush strokes is after the Mao, after Mao died, a, a deal was essentially struck between the CCP and the people where the people were very disillusioned. They'd suffered so much under Mao and the CCP basically said, we know we made some mistakes, but just let us stay in power and we will raise your standard of living as long as you don't think too hard and let us stay in power. So this is the deal. And then what we have going on now is that as the Chinese people's standard of living has risen and as the environment has gotten more and more degraded and as they're more and more fearful about the impacts on their health, they're less and less willing to give the state a pass on this. And they're more and more determined that the state should clean up this air, water, soil, food. So, um, I don't think it's their fault, you know? I, I think that it's hard. It's hard to be a Chinese person, um, but I really appreciate that comment. I don't know if Ife wants to add anything. No, um, I, I think it was just a wonderful comment and then I, I don't have anything to add. Uh, a question of hope um, in the younger generations from Pedro. Do you believe younger generations more aware via online, um, you know, online sites and internet sites and so on and so forth of, pot uh, of potential for potentialities or possibilities for different types of state and civil society relations. And environmentalism uh, will be more critical and even able to become more organized and protest against Chinese state and communist party control. Um, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, Yifei? Um, Perhaps. Yeah, well, I, I guess I can just um, say one quick thing um, by way by way of answering um, is that, you know, some of my Chinese students uh, now, well, let me rephrase the answer. Um, a few years ago, when we had met Chinese students who grew up in China, went to school only in China, um, they still know how to use Google because Google was banned as they were growing up. So they had an understanding of Google being a thing and Google being a search engine that generated reliable results. So when they entered college and when they entered our university, uh, they very quickly picked up Google using and picked up all of the research skills that we wanted them to acquire. But the recent classes of students come in with no understanding of Google whatsoever because Google was banned by the time they were using computers, by the time they started using computers. So we're talking about an entire generation of Chinese young people growing up in an online ecosystem that is self-segregated from the whole world's online ecosystem. Mm. So to the extent that these young people have better access technologically, 
um, to the internet and to information at large. I think technology wise, yes, but access wise, I don't think so. Access wise, we're seeing a lot of Chinese internet nationalism. We're seeing technological nationalism. China essentially has created very much a parallel universe of information. You know, for, for each Facebook, there is a Chinese counterpart. Um, for each um, Twitter, there there is a, a Chinese uh, alternative. Um, so so they're, they're becoming tech savvy, that is for sure. But I, I don't know whether that tech savviness actually translates into critical spirits. Okay. If I if I may ask one last question, Judy, sorry, because we're okay. running out of time. Would that would that be okay to change? Yeah, I, I wanted to add something though. I, I can I add just something? Just, just something very quickly then. Yeah, please. very quickly. I just want to add that um, you know, I think the Chinese people are very proud of the fact that they have become a superpower. You know, they remember how poor they were. And so we assume, oh, because they don't have all these freedoms or this or that, that they're really discontented. They are really discontented about some things like the like pollution and inequality and corruption. But they also know that Xi Jinping has gotten the world to respect China. And that's a tremendous source of pride for them. So that's my comment. Okay, we have a couple of questions about intensive agriculture and meat consumption and their impact in the environment. Okay, um, um, as an example uh, from an anonymous, uh, thank you for this thought provoking uh, presentation. China has become both a model and a, a, a not so much of a model link for environmental leadership globally. Yet under the current pandemic, the focus on wildlife consumption issues, especially as a potential factor behind zoonotic events, risks parochializing and essentializing Chinese practices in relation to environmental impact. Wouldn't, would you say that the consolidation of things like factory farm agriculture and, and the intensification of factory farming, uh, farming in China and elsewhere is more dangerous for both climate change and also zoonotic risk than wildlife consumption issues. Through this, perhaps? Yeah, well, I'm not an expert in that, but I'm a vegetarian and I'm really appalled by the suffering of animals. <laughs> so um, I can't say which is more risky. I certainly, um, I don't know, Ife made a point in a, a couple of other, uh, a, a couple of weeks ago. Um, Tofu is the answer, you know, <laughs> tofu is the answer. So um, sure, factory farming is horrendous on all kinds of grounds, but um, these so-called wet markets are also extremely dangerous. And um, yeah, China, you know, the Chinese people used to be really healthy because meat was maybe something they would have as a condiment during spring festival. And now they're all, they're all little kids are getting fat and they're eating hamburgers and they have heart disease and, you know, so, um, I don't know. But actually, even uh, Xi Jinping has been trying to encourage Chinese people to get less meat into their diet. Yifei, would you like to add something? No, if you look at Chinese national policy, they're encouraging people to eat less meat, as Judy pointed out. But the dairy lobby is just so strong in China that the dairy industry is encouraging people to consume almost three times the amount of dairy that they're using now. Um, the fruit industry, likewise, um, is 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 lobbying heavily. So, so, so I think you know the the, the overall Chinese diet implications remains remains to play out. Um, but I don't know how to how to best answer the question of whether industrial farming or wildlife consumption is going to be more impactful when it comes to global population health. I I just don't think I have the expertise to comment on that. Sorry about it. Okay, I think we our time is up, so I have to to end our conversation here. Many thanks once again, Yifei and Judith, for your contribution to pluralizing the Anthropocene. It's been a truly rewarding talk and, and discussion. Thank you. Um, Yifei and Judith have added another layer of pluralization to this series. Their discussion of Chinese environmental policies have revealed new ways of thinking and approach, approaching the uncertainties of the Anthropocene and their discussion of China's increasing economic and political influence in the global stage has made a compelling case for the need to assess the promises and pitfalls of China's model of environmental governance. 
There is no doubt that the Chinese central government has the power and the, and the capacity as well to accomplish impressive environmental goals. And, uh, but there are also concerns about the societal costs and side effects of China's top-down environmental policies. In this trial, Kifei and Judith have highlighted some of the negative dimensions and consequences, many of which unforeseen, of China's green authoritarianism. This is a major contribution to global Anthropocene discussions on the future of environmental governance and should be seen as a warning against the limitations of top-down authoritarian approaches. If we really want to do something to take care of the planet in China and perhaps anywhere else, we need to find ways of developing a more inclusive bottom-up conversation capable of truly addressing the sustainability of everything and everyone. Please join me in thanking Ife and Judy for their wonderful contribution to pluralizing the Anthropocene. And before you all go, let me just remind you that the next session of this colloquium will take place on May 10th uh, at 2 p.m. Western European Summertime. We will be talking to anthropologist Michael Hersfeld from Harvard University about the politics of planetary and other forms of security in the age of inhumanity. The event is free, but registration is required. Please check the Saralva's website for more details on how to register. Many thanks once again for your support. See you on May 10th. Thank you.